So I am tremendously grateful that you all came this morning. For those of you who have not been here before, this is Beit Shuva. It's a residential recovery community uh, for people dealing with all kinds of issues of addiction. And recently, um, young people who have failed to launch. And um, we have been watching a trend for many years now. Beit Shuva has been doing this work for 30 years. And I think over the last 10, we've begun to see a change in the demographic. In the olden days, when we were taking people who had come out of jail or who were street heroin addicts, family, I remember one family who came and the father said, this is our son, Jack. Our other two sons are attorneys. As if we didn't do anything wrong. He is an aberration. And for a time, I think, it was looked at that way, that the person who didn't achieve, particularly from middle class or affluent or privileged families, was an aberration in that family. And that has changed very dramatically, I think. I think that our whole culture of parenting as a competitive sport is an aberration and that the production of, of perfect and commodified kids has begun to cause the kind of a problem that I think is the moral and spiritual emergency of our time. And I, I've been watching it. Um, a couple of months ago, we had a speaker called Bill Dereshowitz, who wrote a book called Excellent Sheep. He's also a friend of Julie. Julie's in the middle of all of this. All, um, and today, we're very lucky to have Julie Lithcott Hames, who wrote this wonderful book, How to Raise an Adult. And the third in our series will be in October, will be Dr. Lisa Miller, who wrote a book called The Spiritual Child, which I think is the uh, solution to what we're seeing as this problem. And she will be the third speaker. So we have flyers here if you want to take them on your way out. Uh, are you going to say how you came to us? <laughs> I just learned this morning, actually. We, I got a phone call from, from Julie, what, two years ago, a year ago? Um, cold call. Um, I'm writing a book about, you know, the, uh, what I see happening with these uh, anxious, depressed kids at Stanford, and I heard about what you're doing, and what do you have to say about the matter? And we began a relationship. And then I introduced her to Doug Rosen, and we've been uh, in conversation for several years. And so I am really thrilled to meet her today as a real human being. And she's going to speak, and then she's going to be signing books. And um, Julie. Harriet, thank you so much for having me here today to your magnificent Beit Shuva. And Rabbi Mark, thank you for having me, and Adam Mendel and Doug Rosen, who are also uh, folks that uh, we spoke to on this journey. I want to thank them as well for being part of this. Um, it's, it's magnificent to be here, to finally see this space that has been such a, an opportunity for rebirth, a resource, a community for so many. And so thank you for having me, and thank you for selling the book and making it possible for me to come and, and share my thoughts about what's going wrong with raising kids today. I want to thank my friend Jill Boberg and her partner Chris, who are hosting me um, overnight. Thanks, guys. I also want to thank the Stanford Alumni Association, because I know they helped promote this event. And I see a lot of my former students in the room, which is amazing, uh, members of the class of 06, 11, 13, I see. I also see a really great member of the class of 88 who was a student with me back in the day. So, And the rest of you who I haven't given a class shout out to, hi, and thank you for being here. Uh, one of my research coordinators, we, we, I had a team of six people helping me research this book. If you get the book, you'll see there are about 400 footnotes. There are about you know, 10 pages of bibliography. There's meat 
here. I wanted, you know, strength and solid stuff underneath whatever stories and observations I was going to be sharing. So I had a fantastic research team, and Lee Marshall is here. Lee, raise your hand or stand up or something. Lee, um, I asked Lee to join me on this trip. She lives in the Bay Area, as I do, because she was um, on the phone with me as we interviewed Harriet and Adam and Doug and others um, in the Beit Shuvah community. Um, Lee was the one who really helped um, formulate um, our follow-up and you know how to really um, make the most of what we were learning from you guys. So I wanted her to have the chance to be here and um, see this magnificent place and have you guys meet her. Um, to those of you who are strangers to me, parents, educators, members of this community, others who've given up a Sunday to come here for whatever reason, thank you for being here. Like you, I'm just trying to ensure that my kids are healthy and successful. Like you, I struggle. Like you, I worry, I wonder, I wish. We're in this together, all of us, so I welcome you. And finally, I want to give a special welcome to the members of my family who are here. My sister-in-law, Carolyn West, my brother-in-law, David West, and my mother-in-law, Judith Hames, who I affectionately call Mama Judy. So welcome to my family. And um, yes, please give, give them a round of applause. And I want you to remember that my mother-in-law is in the room, so clap extra loud when you're at the end. <laughs> Normally at an event like this, we'd ask you to put away your phones. But if I may humbly say so, with How to Raise an Adult, I aim to start a movement to try to push the pendulum back in the other direction, away from raising kids to be completely dependent upon us for protection, accustomed to our constant direction, and reliant upon us for help, and toward raising independent adults. And if the movement's not to be televised, then at least it can be socialized. So whip out those phones and use them. If you're on Facebook, ch check in at Beit Teshuva and head over to my book's page, How to Raise an Adult, and like it too. Take a picture of yourself with the book later and post it. If you're on Twitter, our handle is at Raise an Adult. Live tweet this event, tweet your takeaways after. And if you're not a social media user, hi, Mama Judy. <laughs> Okay, yeah, put away your phone and make eye contact with me. That's a precious resource these days, and I'm going to cherish that too. We're here this morning to discuss my book, How to Raise an Adult, which, with its publication almost three months ago, has sort of branded me as somewhat of a parenting expert. But to be frank, I'm not so sure how I feel about that. I mean, I didn't set out to be a parenting expert. And for that matter, I'm not particularly interested in parenting. No. And now some of you are wondering, what the heck am I here for then? I thought she was going to talk about parenting. I got dragged here on a perfectly wonderful Sunday morning to hear a talk on parenting, some of you are thinking. But even at the risk of your disappointment and confusion, I'll say it again. I'm not interested in parenting, per se. What I'm interested in is human beings. I believe in humans. I believe in all of us. You, me, you way over there in the back. I believe in all of us making our way in the world. I believe this not only for the sake of each individual, but for the sake of us all. I believe the world needs us, each one of us, to figure out who we are, what we're good at, what we love, what we value, and then to work very hard to be the very best version of that self we can muster. From my work with countless young adults, I've learned that having the courage to be who we are, regardless of what other people want or say, even parents, is the path to a meaningful and rewarding life. And so, I'm interested in what gets in the way of each of us being our best self, in the obstacles, and I'm interested in trying to do something about it. Now, I used to think the obstacles stemmed chiefly from otherness, outsiderness, from being on the margins due to family background, demographics, status, circumstance. And yes, of course, those things are obstacles, sometimes tremendous obstacles to a person's chances for becoming their best self. 
When I was freshman dean at Stanford, a position I held for 10 years, I presumed that students from those backgrounds would most need a caring, thoughtful dean, someone to believe in them when their background and family narrative collided with all that Stanford would ask and expect of them. And yes, some of my favorite moments as dean were indeed spent mentoring such students. But since I was expecting that the students who would most need my help would be the other, imagine how surprised I was to discover among my more affluent students a growing number who seemed to lack the ability to make their way independently in the world as frankly 18 to 22 year olds just used to be able to do and just as crucially used to desire to do. And I'm deliberately being vague about what exactly was missing in more and more of my students each year because frankly, I couldn't quite tell at first. Something was just odd, off. It took most of my 10 years as dean before I figured out what exactly the problem was. For starters, each year my students were more and more and more and more accomplished. They had done so much. You know what I mean? Ha, huh. let's be real. You know exactly what I mean. The grades and the AP classes, but not just the grades and the APs, the scores, and not just the grades and the scores, but the awards and the accolades and the sports and the activities and community service and leadership and, 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 and such perfection expected. Yes, my students were so seemingly more and more accomplished each year, yet, each year I noticed that more and more of them could tell you what they'd done, but not so much why they'd done it, other than to get into college. They could tell you what they'd achieved, but not so much about what mattered to them. These students were far more interesting to look at on paper than to talk with in person. Was any of this stuff really their passion? Did they even know what that word meant? Or was it just something someone said they needed in order to get into the quote unquote right college? Did they have a budding sense of self? Or were they really just content to let their parents plan life for them? I believe in humans and seeing so many promising young adults walking a path of someone else's making, already a little burned out, kind of old before their time, perplexed me. As this was going on, each year brought more and more parents who came with their kid to college and stayed, sometimes literally, but much more often virtually, to ask questions, select courses, activities, majors, internships and careers, solve problems, handle conflict, defend and advocate for their student, register for classes, fill out applications, track deadlines, and call to wake them up. And to top it all off, my students weren't mortified when their parents did all of this. They were grateful. They communicated with a parent multiple times a day, in the dorm, in the dining halls, in the student union, going to class, going to another class, going somewhere after class, in the lobby of the advising office where I worked. Even in my office, or they tried to. Could we call my mom, they'd say, pulling out their phone sheepishly with a shrug? It'd be easier if we just got her on the phone. I believe in humans, so I thought to myself, something's not right. Is this college or middle school? <laughs> remember the movie Stepford Wives? Some of you old enough to remember the movie? Okay, let me not say old enough. Uh, you remember the movie Stepford Wives? The 1975 feminist allegory of women who were not actually humans, but instead were robots programmed by their husbands to be the paradigmatic perfect wife. That movie came to mind as I watched my students live their college lives, still somehow looking over to the sidelines for mom or dad's direction, protection, or intervention, as if they were five years old playing soccer, needing mom or dad to tell them in which direction to kick the ball. I began to wonder, are we raising Stepford children? Of course, closeness, affection, love, frequent communication, that's all good. Who among us? In the older generation, Gen X and Baby Boom wouldn't wish for a closer relationship with our own parents. I'm a member of Gen X, the latchkey generation. So this kind of constant communication between parent and adult child at first seems so cute to me. But when the dynamic between parent and adult child is this constant chatter about choices, possibilities and outcomes, the should and shouldn'ts of life, the want to and ought nots, the how do I do this and the let me take care of that for you's, 
When it came to all manner of their academic, professional, emotional, and personal lives, this intertwinedness moved, in my view, from a cute family picture to a rather disfigured portrait of a chronologically adult man or woman incapable of fending for themselves. My students were not only celebrating the joys of life with parents, which I think is quite natural and appropriate and lovely, they turned to them whenever something went even mildly wrong, a flat tire, a tiff with a roommate, less than great on an assignment, as if their first instinct was to call or text a parent, an instinct as natural as taking a breath of air and as essential. They didn't seem to know how to contend with what life would throw their way, how to sit with discomfort or indecision or opportunity and emerge with their own sense of how to move forward. So intertwined with their parents, they didn't seem to know how to be their own selves. As a believer in humans, that's what made me worry for their future. And even for our future as a species, which believe me, I know sounds kind of hysterical, but when you work with thousands of the so-called best and brightest and you see in a growing number a kind of existential impotence, as I call it, and then you talk to colleagues at colleges around the country, not just the elite schools, but at schools in every tier, and they see this, and you realize this isn't just a San Francisco Bay Area thing or a Stanford thing, but a middle and upper middle class American thing nationwide, and you see that the rates of mental health problems in children and adolescents and young adults are soaring, particularly in affluent communities, you get concerned, really concerned. That concern for humans is what made me write How to Raise an Adult, a book on, well, as it turns out, parenting. What's going on with parenting? I was mortified to discover the answer staring back at me in the mirror one day. Every fall at freshman orientation, I'd give a talk to parents. The purpose of the talk was to embrace parents empathize with the big transition they were experiencing, and give some pretty direct advice. I'd say, trust your kid is capable of handling this. Trust the institution wants to do not as little as we can get away with, but as much as we possibly can. Now go home. <laughs> I never actually wagged my finger at parents, but inside I was thinking, come on, folks, back off. This is college now. Go away. In 2009, the day after giving that annual speech, I came home from work, sat down for dinner, and reached over and began cutting my kids' meat. <laughs> they were eight and 10 at the time. They're now 14 and 16. And it was like all of a sudden, I was being visited by Dickens's ghost of Christmas future or something. If you want your kid to be independent at 18, at some point you have to stop cutting their meat. I sat up straight, when do you stop cutting their meat? When do you stop looking both ways for them as they cross the street? When do you stop helping with their homework? When do you let them talk to strangers? I realized I was still treating my kids like little kids. They never went anywhere alone. They did no chores. They had no responsibilities. I praised every little thing like it was the most amazing thing and tried to ensure that the path in front of them was as smooth as possible. One day earlier, I'd been tisk tisking my students' parents about not being able to let go of their college-age sons and daughters, only to realize I was fostering tremendous dependence in my own kids with no end to that in sight. Was I in danger of being one of those parents who couldn't let go when my kids were in college? What? Who? Me? That night I realized I'd been given the rare gift of seeing the results of thousands of upbringings and childhoods in the form of other people's grown sons and daughters. Why was childhood no longer preparing so many kids for independent adulthood? Why were college students and 20-somethings now referring to themselves as kids? How would my generation pass the mantle of leadership on to such adults? How am I and countless other parents getting it so wrong? Because it's not as if we're not trying. God knows we are trying so very hard to get it right. 
For some perspective, let's go back to how it all began. In the beginning, our love is our umbilicus, our heartbeat, our body, and then our arms, our kiss, our breast. We bring them home to a sheltering roof, and we delight weeks later when they make that first intentional eye contact with us. We nurture early babbles into first words and applaud as they gain strength to roll over, to sit up, and to crawl. We scan the horizon of the 21st century and see an increasingly interconnected and competitive world that at times seems familiar and at times utterly not. And we gaze down at our precious little ones with a promise to do all we can to help them make their way into the long life that lies ahead. There is no amount of direction on our part that will force them to stand or walk before they are ready. So we watch and wait and clap and encourage. If you think about it, that may be the last time we actually believe in falling in failure as the essential teacher, the builder of a human's capabilities and resilience. We see almost instantly that they are their own person, but we also want them to start where we left off, to stand on our strong shoulders, to benefit from all we know and can provide, we expose them to experiences, ideas, people, and places that we think will help them learn and grow and thrive. We want them to reach and be stretched by the kind of rigor and opportunity that will maximize their potential and their chances. We're sure we know best what it takes to succeed in today's world. Extremely high GPA and test scores in high school and admission to a tiny handful of colleges we've been made to believe are the only ones that matter and we're quite eager to protect and direct them and be there for them at every turn, whatever it takes to achieve those outcomes. We mean so, 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 so well, but in communities like ours, doing whatever it takes has come to mean what I call the checklisted childhood. It's all the things our kids must experience and achieve in order to gain entry to a small number of schools and the right careers and achieve that definition of success. In furtherance of that, everything for our children is safe, selected, chosen, recommended, planned, decided, approved, improved, done, accomplished, handled, coached, figured out, fixed, arranged, solved, resolved, absolved, shaped, designed, orchestrated, and dreamed for them. Then we hover over our kids as they check off all the items on the checklist. We keep them safe and sound and fed and watered. And when we see an obstacle in their path, we try to remove it, all the while encouraging them along toward that GPA, all those APs, the higher scores, accolades, and awards, nudging, cajoling, hinting, helping, haggling, nagging, as the case may be, to be sure they're not screwing up, not closing doors, not ruining their future, calling for help when needed in the form of tutors, coaches, handlers, extra spiffy, coaches and handlers in order to improve the child in front of us. We say we just want them to be happy, but when they come home from school, what we ask first is about their grades. And they see in our faces that approval, that love, that worth comes from taking more APs and getting A's. When the work is hard, we stand ever closer, running alongside with clucking praise like a trainer at the Westminster Dog Show, coaxing them to jump ever farther and soar ever higher, arguing and contending with the rule makers when they fall or fail, forcing them back on the path, using our own strength to boost their effort. Their ears are filled with our chirps of perfect, great job, a rhetorical tick we use even when we don't mean it. And we commend them to our friends and with stickers on the backs of our cars. And also we commend ourselves. Look what we've done. We did this amazing California mission project. We wrote this beautiful essay. We earned this GPA. We've gotten into this college. Right? Recognize any of that? I sure do. Thank you. In communities like ours, parents have the disposable time and income to do everything for our kids. And when I finally connected the dots between that dinner with parents of Stanford freshmen and what was happening at dinner in my own house, I realized parents can't just magically stop telling kids what to do and helping them do it in college if they've been behaving that way with their high school senior. 
and they can't magically stop with their high school senior if they were so involved with their high school junior, and so on. What I realized is childhood is meant to provide opportunities for them to gain more and more skills and independence, to try and fail, to learn to do and think for themselves. If only we'd let it, childhood would do that, but we don't. And I realized that this omnipresent over-involvement of parents means kids may grow to be chronologically adult, but remain rather stunted, dependent on parents to do not only the planning and deciding of life, but the lovely, light, ethereal dreaming as well. Look, my book is called How to Raise an Adult, but it could just as easily have been called The Road to Hell. <laughs> because we planned and paved our child's perfect path with the very best of intentions. But if you look at what we've done, if you have the courage to really look at it, you see that when we've walked so closely alongside our kids, when we've told them not only what to do with their lives, but how to do it, when we do the work for them when they struggle, and even when they aren't struggling, we just overhelp to ensure that they get that extra edge when we push, 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 when we make them study a certain thing, shape their dreams, tell them who they must be to make us proud, we've actually undermined our kids' chance to make their own way. Too many playwrights and poets are forced into STEM. A teenager commits suicide, and his obituary includes his SAT score. And you know what the worst part of this is, besides how arrogant it is to force someone else's life path in a particular direction toward a particular college or career, how unethical it is to overhelp with their homework, how cruel it is to be a constant crutch that will not always be able to be there for them, how harmful it is to make them feel our love is conditioned on admission to a certain school. The worst part, unintended yet insidious, that results when we live right up in their heads all the time, they get this message, kid, I don't think you can do any of this without me. Trying to boost them up, we are paradoxically tearing them down. We overhelp so as not to disadvantage them, yet they're disadvantaged because we do so much. You're not good enough for this life as you are, is the message. You never will be. You can't make your own decisions. Be trusted with the task of being successful in life. You need me to direct and guide you. You will always need me. I believe in humans, and I have to tell you, we're smothering the life, the very sense of self, out of our precious kids. Our job as parents is to put ourselves out of a job and raise our precious offspring to independence. We gave them life, but life is to be lived in order for them to become the beautifully unique individual they are, we have to let them be. We've succeeded as parents if our adult children can fend for themselves. And I looked it up. Fend means look after and provide for oneself without any help from others, not call your parents and have them fend for you. We're supposed to want that for them, but these days, too many of us seem sickly engaged by their need to constantly need us, which is a need, remember, that we manufactured. We've got to back off for our kids' sake, but also for our own. As I've said many times, I believe in humans, and guess what? That includes us parents, too. Many of us spend our lives scheduled to the hilt between work and home, homework and homeroom, practice tests and practice fields, trying to keep up with the judgmental Joneses. Ours is an endless shuffle to a rehearsal, a practice, a tutoring session, an expert of some kind designed to make our kid better at something. We are on autopilot in our minivans, going through the motions, making the snacks, being on the committees, arguing with teachers, principals, coaches, and referees, serving as our kids' concierge, personal assistant, secretary, fearing our spouse's expectations, vaguely wondering when we'll get off the sidelines of soccer practice and start living our own rich, vibrant life again. Our morning medication is caffeine. Our evening medication is wine. Long, long, long gone are the days of throwing open the back door and saying, get out there and play, I'll call you for dinner. There are no wide open doors, or afternoons for that matter. 
and no one is home to play. If you're a boomer or Gen X, that's ancient history. If you're a millennial, it sounds like fiction. No, there's no time for that, no room. There's only the schedule and the drop-off and the pickup and some semblance of that family dinner we know we're supposed to have and then the homework until some set of us plus them is exhausted, sleep, repeat. When I was writing How to Raise an Adult, a mom in my community pulled me aside at a meeting and pleaded, when did childhood get so stressful? I put my hand on her shoulder and as tears slowly filled her eyes, another mother who had overheard us nodded her head and walked toward us. And the second mother then said, do you know how many moms in our community are medicated for anxiety? I didn't know the answer to either question, but a growing number of conversations like this with parents like these became another reason to write my book. I believe in humans, in all of us, and I guess you could say that my role as a college dean afforded me a view of the future that frightened me. And now I'm running back to warn you, all of us, that this overly protective, overly directive, overly hand-holding approach to parenting is harmful to kids, to parents, and to us all. I'm here with this book and this rhetoric and this book tour and some kind of authority that comes from it all. But did you really need me to say any of this to you? No. You know it. We all know it. We hear about 20-somethings, even 30-somethings failing to launch. We see our children withering under the pressure of the checklisted childhood, growing up in the scaffolding of our expectations. We feel ourselves struggling to do all that parents have to do these days to ensure the checklist is adhered to. We remember our own freer childhoods lived not that long ago, and we imagine a different, saner way for our own kids and ourselves, perhaps elsewhere. I don't know, Wyoming? <laughs> Yet we look over our shoulder and see the galloping herd of other parents who are constantly hovering over their kids, cultivating them like precious little bonsai trees, spending more money, hiring more experts, taking more time off just to ensure their kid makes the grade, makes the cut, gets admitted to that school over our kid, bragging about their outcomes. We wanna trust our instincts, wish we were brave enough to walk away, focus on family time, not test prep, incite laughter, prompt joy, let our kids just be. But we fear the herd and the short-term win their kid will achieve with all that help. Even when we know better, even when we know we know better, the overparenting herd is like a bully we feel the need to go along with lest we be hurt by it even further. We parents love our children with a driving force an aching, fierce, terror, joy we can barely begin to understand. It is the most humbling, precious task, a bewildering task to raise another human. 10 years ago, when I wrote my first piece on the harm of overparenting, I was just a college dean with a whole lot of compassion for young adults and a mounting concern that something was just not right. Ten years later, there is abundant evidence from study after study from the field of psychology that our overprotection, overdirection, and excessive handholding harms kids, deprives them of life skills, renders them less capable in the workplace, and leads to much higher rates of anxiety and depression. According to a very recent study of 100,000 college students from 153 campuses, including all the schools you've heard of and many you have not. 100,000 college students reported 84.3% said they were overwhelmed by all they had to do. That's more than three quarters of 100,000 college students. 60.5% were very sad, 57% were very lonely, 51.3% felt overwhelming anxiety, 46.5%, just under one half, felt things were hopeless. Remember, this was from kids all over. Tiers one, two, and three, large universities, small colleges, east, west, north, and south. It's not just those who get into and attend the most elite schools. There's an unhealthy amount of pressure and stress in childhood 
itself today, everywhere, it seems. Nobody knows that better than Harriet Rosetto and her team here at Beit Shuva, who themselves have conducted research which indicates that the rates of anxiety and depression are higher in affluent kids than in juvenile delinquents who tend to be at the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum. I spoke to a set of high school juniors the other day. I told them that I'd be talking to their parents that night and asked them what they wanted me to tell them. They were silent for minutes. It's uncomfortable to be a speaker behind a podium with 350 kids in front of you not responding to your question. And I kept saying, it's okay, I won't tell them, I won't attach the name to the comment, you know. And then finally I said, I know you're feeling maybe embarrassed or ashamed or whatever about, you know, this thing that you want me to tell your parents by way of what they can do or should stop doing to support you, but I promise you there are other people in the room who feel that way. Then one brave kid raised his hand and I called on him and he stood up and he said, please tell them that the brand name of the school isn't as important as they think. And the entire auditorium of 350 kids burst into applause. And that had opened the door. So then the comments were, please tell them, you don't have to worry about every little thing. Tell them it's scary, I put pressure on myself, I don't need more from you. One kid said, I have no social life, but I need one. Another said, you don't always hear us. Another said, start believing in me and not comparing me to others. The mother in me just ached when they said this, these strangers, these kids. We can and must do better. Look, there's a lot wrong in society. Larger forces that both constrain and impel us as parents such as that myth that there are only a handful of colleges that are colleges we could be proud to send our kid to. But let's not forget, despite those societal forces, that we have tremendous control at what I call the local, local level of our kitchen counter and dining room table, where we've got children who'll need dinner tonight and breakfast tomorrow morning. Join me in doing right by those kids, our children, by leaving the herd of hoverers, fostering independence, not dependence, by pulling back our blinders and looking at a greater number of post high school options, and by supporting them and being who they are, rather than telling them who and what to be. Together, we can push the parenting pendulum back in the other direction, away from overprotected, overdirected, handheld, anxiety and depression riddled forever children, and toward raising healthy, happy, successful adults. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Rabbi Mark. So um, how about if we sit over here because I, I've got I wasn't supposed to do this, but you know, I'm a tubercular. Um, <laughs> so I have some questions for you, some thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm a divorced parent and, and um, made quite a few mistakes with my daughter. Uh, I guess the only good thing I did was that um, I got her so angry that she wouldn't let me hover. Mm -hmm. Right? So I, I was listening to you and I was struck. Um, in Judaism, I, I, um, when a child is born, you don't say the name right away. You have to um, pick their Hebrew name based on looking into their eyes and seeing the trait of their soul that is so prominent and then um, either naming him for that trait or naming him after somebody who has passed, has passed away and, and for that person. And I've said for years that that's the last time we go to raise our children's souls. Mm. So to me, what you were talking about is, is this whole sense of, of spirit. Yeah. And, and how are you doing with your kids now? How am I doing with mine? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, thank you for that um, beautiful comment and that beautiful thought. Um, I didn't mention that my husband's family is Jewish, and um, so I've come to know and appreciate and love tenants of the Jewish faith, thanks to my mother-in-law and um, extended family. Um, so it's lovely to hear you say that. Um, you know, that bonsai tree um, metaphor that I used earlier has really been in my mind. Um, I realized that when we're so certain that we know what they should be and should study and do, we're essentially pruning them, we're clipping them, not only to prompt growth, you know, which is healthy, but to shape them into a, a state we imagine. And to this issue of soul, um, to this notion of they are their own human, and it is actually my responsibility and my privilege to get to be in their lives and nourish them and help them make their way, I've started seeing my own kids more as wildflowers of an unknown genus or species. I don't know when they bloom, you know, what they'll look like, but it's my job to provide the environment, you know, so they have the, nu the nutrients, the environment, the support to become themselves. And I really do mean that in a soul sense, in a spiritual sense, um, you know, working with tens of thousands of, of young people, I saw those who were thriving. You know, my, my talk is about those who were hovered over and who didn't have the capacity to be adult in their own lives. But, you know, the other set of them, each year diminishing in number, had the wherewithal, had a sense of self. They weren't perfect, that's not the point. They didn't have it all figured out, but they had a hunger to know themselves better and they had a confidence that they could try and try and try and work toward a set of goals and pick themselves up and chart a course and chart another one. You know, they just had a sense of self, which was beautiful. And so looking at so many other people's grown sons and daughters, I thought, okay, I want mine to be more like these guys, not like these guys. And um, as I've said, you know, in other places, as parents, I think we have to sort of humble ourselves at the altar of childhood and actually appreciate it's not about us. This is another human's life. None of us wants to be constrained by what our parents think or society thinks of us. We want to make our own way, you know? That's what our kids want too. So with the very best of intentions, of course, I mean, I, I know that every parent fiercely loves a kid and wants the best for them, but I think our own egos, our own sense of self have gotten intertwined with our kids' existence, and so it's hard to let them be because what does that say about us if they don't somehow you know, emerge to the world's applause. Yes, uh, Harriet Rosetta wants to oh, she say wants something. To say something. Now. Okay, yes. I don't argue with her. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the rest of the universe is not here today to hear you. <laughs> because how do we begin now, given the fear that parents have to be the one who opts out of the herd? How do we begin to change the vision of, of parenting and to give people permission to raise kids um, who become adults and, and find their own sense of self? I, I want to change the world, uh, you know? I think you are, Harry. Today? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so there's a great book you should all read. It's called How to Raise an Adult. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, there's actually another book uh, that I recommend, The Gift of Failure. It's by Jessica Leahy. Just came out a couple weeks ago. Reviewed I reviewed it in the New York Times, which is a great honor for me. And she's a middle school teacher and a parent who's written about how middle school ought to provide that opportunity for a kid to you know, try and fail and try and fail. Like middle school offers opportunity for failure and therefore growth and learning, if only we'll let it. And so um, here's what I say. Look, I live in Palo Alto, which is you know, as energetic a hive of overparenting as you're likely to find. Um, and um, everyone there is certain that their kids, you know, in order to be successful and valued as humans, need to go to one of those brand name schools. And I'll admit to you that once upon a time I felt that way. Um, many people do. You know, I, I'm a graduate of Stanford University. I met my husband there. Our kids were born there, they went to nursery school there, and I worked there. You know, so it's like, why? Of course they're gonna go to, you know, I want them to go to Stanford or a place like it. And um, 
And I realized we were crafting their childhood in furtherance of that desired outcome, as many people are, whatever the school might be. For some, it's USC. For some, it's UCLA. For some, it's Harvard. For some, wherever. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you know, you tend to have that hope. And um, one of the things I learned in the course of researching my book um, was just how many, many four-year colleges and universities are out there in this nation. You know, U.S. News and World Report would have us believe it's about this many. And um, they make a lot of money every year uh, feeding on our fears. They are the equivalent in their franchise that, that college um, rankings issue is the equivalent of Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue when it comes to being the one issue on which the entire franchise rests financially. This is true. Gwen Ifill has said it on PBS, and I believe Gwen Ifill. Um, okay, so the point is there are 2,800 accredited four-year colleges and universities, and as in this nation, not to mention great community colleges, and I'd wager that as with anything, the top 5% are probably magnificent. That's 140 schools that are offering a fantastic education where we can feel confident our sons and daughters are getting great teaching, access you know, to a fantastic undergraduate experience. And um, you know, if we can actually really believe that, we can take an enormous exhale, a great breath of relief. Um, because most of those places don't have cutthroat admission rates because they're not as well known. So um, this is one of the messages I try to spread with parents. If we can um, allow ourselves, if we can pull back our own blinders so the future for our kids isn't this tiny stacked set of impossible to get into schools, if we can appreciate that there's say 140 of them, 200 of them, whatever you want, number you want to pick, we can relax. Then every moment of their childhood doesn't feel make or break. Every quiz, every piece of homework, every goal or not, you know, doesn't feel make or break. Right now our kids feel so hovered over. You know, they see our anxiety, they see how invested we are in their outcomes. You know, it's, it's harming them. So if we can relax a little bit, you know, we can actually raise our kids to that point of chronological adulthood with their self-esteem, self sense of self, self-efficacy, you know, mental health intact that's gonna prepare them for successful adulthood. Um, so I think one of the things we've gotta do in communities like this is get to know the names of other schools, you know, and just be willing to look at, for example, colleges that change lives. A lovely gathering, a nonprofit organization, colleges that change lives, um, 40 schools, most of which you haven't heard, and um, you know, uniformly alumni say this place changed my life. Great teaching, great community, great experience. Um, you know, there's a great resource called the Alumni Factor that looks not at the incoming SAT scores and high school GPA of freshmen, but something much more useful, like what, are the, what have the alumni gone on to do in terms of their financial success, their professional accomplishments, their sense of happiness, their delight with their personal relationships, you know, and it's a great measure of what alumni have actually experienced in life, the Alumni Factor. So those are two great resources that I think can open our eyes and help us pull the blinders back. Um, but even knowing that, I didn't actually, I still was one of those, well, but wouldn't it be nice if they went to Stanford kind of people. And with a 5.02 admission rate, right? Yes, we should laugh because it is absurd. Um, it's just horrendous. And um, I was speaking with a woman named Sidonia Dalby, Sid, she goes by. She lives in Northampton, Massachusetts. She's an admissions officer at Smith College. Um, which is an all-women's um, um, school, and it's up there with Hampshire and UMass Amherst and Amherst and Mount Holyoke. And she gives talks in her community about college admission, and she says to people, I know many of you are certain you want your kid to go to this, that, and the other school, but let me ask you this. If there's a 5 to 10% chance of rain, do you take an umbrella? Mm -mm. 5 to 10% chance of rain, you're not going to take an umbrella, you're not going to take a raincoat. Why? Because you know those odds, you know, are not going to pan out, right? But when there's a 5 to 10% chance of admission, as is the case now at about 20 schools, somehow we think those odds will eventuate in our kids' favor. Why is that? It's completely irrational. When Sid Dalby said this to me, I was interviewing her for my book, all of a sudden I got it and realized, okay, 
steering my kid toward that expectation, this is sort of like winning an education lottery. You know, first of all, there are plenty more schools. I know as an educator, you can get a great education, often a better education at the very small liberal arts colleges, not the big universities with the biggest branding, okay? If I'm steering my kids toward that, and that's how I appear to be happy when they're, you know, if they make that, then I'm thrilled. You know, they feel like utter failure if they haven't achieved it. You know, why am I doing that to my kids? If they want that and get in, and that's where they want to go, I'm fantastic, but good for them. But let's not steer childhood toward that really unlikely um, eventual result. Once Sidonia Dalby said that to me, I was able to authentically embrace that. You know, I want my kids to not have a hellish junior year, to not have a high school experience that burns them out in furtherance of the 4.297, whatever. You know, all of those APs. I was able to finally get it because of what Sid said. And I think in communities like ours, if we can embrace that, we can help, we can back off and let our kids grow to be who they're meant to be. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for some other questions. Um, all you have to do is go over to the microphone. Um, okay, I have two questions. Hi, what's your name? Michelle Good. Hi, Michelle. I have a 14-year-old um, and a 10-year-old that go to a very high-pressured private school. Okay. I have, a, I have yeah, two kids that go to a um, school that you've heard of, very, a lot of pressure. So my questions are, the first one is, can, because there's such expectations, can't the colleges not expect so much, then the high schools won't expect so much, and these kids, it gives them a little bit less pressure? Yeah. Is that it's my first question? Let me address that, Michelle. Um, wouldn't it be nice if they magically did this? Um, I know that college admissions officers are rather mortified at how horrendous it's become. Every year they've just been delighted. Wow, kids are more and more accomplished. They're more and more high achieving. They haven't, you know, if they look, you know, every year it's been incremental, but if they look back 20 years, it's sort of absurd that it used to take this to get in, you know, and now to get into that same place, it takes this. And yet kids are still only 17 or 18 and they're still only 168 hours in every week. We haven't changed that yet we're expecting so much more of our kids, no wonder they're burned out and losing their minds. So I know those good folks are interested in what they can do to signal different things, but the fact is, so maybe they could say, we're gonna cap the number of APs we'll look at. You can take 10, but we'll only look at four, or whatever it might be. Some or kids don't even have a, Some kids don't some, even have a chance. No, exactly. Um, so maybe they can figure out better ways to actually evaluate a kid, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. They're still only gonna have a few thousand spots or fewer in their class, and they're still gonna be tens of thousands of kids applying. So what we've gotta do is, even if they do change, you know, the, the odds of our, our kid might be more likely to be admitted if, if they tweak their admission process, um, but likely to be admitted over some, someone else's kid, but a whole slew are still gonna get denied. So we've got to ad, appreciate and accept and embrace the fact that there are great schools that we'd be proud to have our kids go to where the faculty are fantastic and the alumni network is strong and they have a great education. That's the best thing we can do. Okay, my second question is, letting go during the teenage years, yeah. they make a mistake that is gonna change their life. Or they're making a mistake, and you, you don't wanna hover, but you know they're going down a path that isn't healthy for them. So if it's a health and safety issue, uh, you know that's when we really need to trust our gut, trust our instincts, intervene, do something. And you have experts here who can say far more on the subject than I can. But very often we think something is gonna ruin their lives when what we really mean is they're not gonna get into the right college or you know, some door of opportunity will be foreclosed to them in the future. And this is where I kind of come back to Rabbi Mark's you know, initial comment, which is the, they are their own person. And whatever dreams we have for them, it really ought to be more about their character and the way they can behave with other humans rather than the actual job they'll have or the actual salary they'll have. Create an expectation that you know, they can work hard, persevere, be kind to others. Those are the traits and capacities that are going to help them find uh, you know, friendship and love and help them find a job and move up the ladder. You know, it's really not about the more specific things that we're certain will lead to success. So, 
So I think it comes down to, is this a character issue? Is this about, you know, they're slacking off? They're just little, you know, entitled slackers, and I'm annoyed with that, and i got to do something about it? You know, are they not, they don't know how to be kind in the world? They don't know how to be with other humans? You know, those are the pieces and the health and safety that I would worry about. The rest, to me, is window dressing. Yeah. Right, I think that Absolutely. that's a, a big part of this is, Thank is you that, that. Um, so when I was growing up, back in the day, as they say. Um, we played baseball in the street. And if you, uh, um, I mean, we slid on the, on the asphalt of the street, you know what I mean? Yeah. To, to, um, right. So, so we were always having scrapes and, and everything. And um, what happened, was, if any of us went home crying to the parent, yeah. whoever's parent, they would look at us and they'd say, what are you doing here? Go back out and keep playing. Yeah. And um, so I think a big piece of this is that um, colleges, parents, society has forgotten that failing forward is where it's at. Absolutely. And it, it, there's an irony in Silicon Valley because the whole ethos of Silicon Valley is failure way forward. You know, we get to these great, you know, entrepreneurial technological inventions by just trying and failing and trying and failing and trying again. Um, and yet parents who themselves are highly successful are trying to engineer the failure out of their own kids' lives, forgetting that it's the essential teacher. Um, yes, thank you, Harriet, for shouting that out. I, I overlooked that really important piece. Um, failure is actually, you know, how a human learns and grows. It is absolutely essential. And when they have had a childhood devoid of failure because mom or dad have been there to smooth the path and intervene and fix it, um, they get to college and they experience failure in the form of a B or a C or worse, and their world shatters because they have no coping skills because it's never happened before, and now they feel that they're the only one, they're anomalous, they're the only ones in this rarefied environment now, college, that are you know, not quite perfect. And so we just, it m completely messes with the healthy construction of self if you know, we don't permit childhood to um, you know, throw curveballs at them. Right. Hi. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm nodding vigorously I at everything. I appreciated I'm a, it. <laughs> I'm a dean and college counselor at one of those schools, and every single thing you said resonated every single thing. And I, I guess my question is, how do we at institutions that have an opportunity to, I mean, we, we give failure opportunities wherever we can, but at the same time, what do you tell schools to, uh, how can we help? I realize that parents are parents, but yeah. we have a parenting responsibility as well, whether it's to help the parents parent or help yep. the kids learn. Yeah. What, what's the message yeah. that you give to schools? I didn't catch your name. Sharon, Sharon. Cruzio. Nice to meet you. Um, I think schools are desperate for help in this regard. Parents are helping too much with homework. Schools know it, teachers know it. Guess what, your, teacher, your kid's teacher doesn't know what your kid actually knows if you're correcting their math or rewriting their essay. So, you know, it's like, remember, you've been in fourth grade. It's your kid's turn. You've been an eighth grader. It's your kid's turn, okay? Don't do the work for them. You think it's gonna help them achieve the better grade, and it might, but they don't learn it for themselves. They end up this sort of manufactured person who's got this message in their head, I'm not actually capable of being an eighth grader without my mom or dad doing the work for and with me. So I think we, as schools and school districts, um, to adopt a policy you know, that is a, embracing of this development of a human, which is humans need to do for themselves, to develop self-efficacy, this foundational concept in psychology, humans have to see how their own behavior results in outcomes and then work toward you know, greater accomplishment and even mastery. And when a parent gets in the way, it gets in the way. So kind of at the philosophical level, embracing your role as educators to say you know, at the start of the school year, to say, to embrace in your materials and your website, this is how we believe you know, children grow and develop. And that means parents, you gotta sit on your hands, you gotta bite your tongue, you know, trust that your kid can have the tough conversation with the teacher, trust that your kid you know, will make mistakes and the teacher is there to teach them and that's how they learn and they will improve over time. You know, essentially stop, stop thinking we are in this fourth grade, this eighth grade, this 12th grade. Let your kid be that person. But you know, another thing the schools have to do, and you've not said the name of the school, but you've said it's one everybody knows. You know, you guys 
schools like yours are really interested in the colleges your graduates get into. Your own success is measured by how many kids got into this school and how many got into that school, right? You're prouder to say this and that instead of this. And that's got to change as well. Right. And that's hard. And, no. you know, that's a community conversation for you guys. No, and I think g going to the mental health stats and seeing yeah. actually this over hovered, over scheduled, you know, test prepped up the wazoo, highest GPA at all costs, childhood might lead to admission to that place. But, but what's, it's under what's the cost. It harms <laughs> them. They are harmed, and we mustn't take these chances with our kids' mental health. Yeah. And yeah. my last question, though, just hopefully really quickly, is did the parents listen when the next Oh my God, did they listen? You? Good. This was in when Atlanta. Those, yeah. And they listened and they cried and they, you know, they got it. Hearing their own kids' words about how hard it is, is um, I think one of the keys to this, tapping into parents' actual heart space around this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to throw something else in. And I think that the part of the problem is, is that schools have become now factories. And uh, um, even colleges, when, when I went to college once, back in the day, back in the day for a year, um, it, was to, it was a place to learn. It was a place to argue. It was a place to, to wrestle it out with, with other students and, and with, uh, um, with faculty. Yeah. I don't even know. And I went to Ohio State University, so yeah. it's not like it was a small university. Right. So I, I, is faculty doing that anymore? Oh, absolutely. I mean, faculty are... Did I lose my... Okay. Um, when parents are uh, wanting to contend with, you know, the, the out, you know, parents not happy with a grade or the kid's not happy, but the parent's the one that emails them, you know, faculty want to teach. Faculty are, by definition, passionate about a subject. It's their entire life. It's their entire world. And if they're teaching undergraduates, it's because they delight in bringing that subject alive to young minds. They want to engage in those rigorous conversations. And, you know, we want students to be prepared for that. When I refer to the checklisted childhood, you know, one of the things that happens to kids raised that way is they get to college and when they get a wide, if they've lived a childhood where every step has been laid in front of them, they've just had to be great at accomplishing that, um, they discover college is this wide open landscape of opportunity and they're bewildered because it's way too much choice. And, you know, if they've given an English assignment that's, you know, sort of open ended and vague, you know, the feedback scrawled on the paper is tell me more, what about this, you know, et cetera. And they say to their teacher, just tell me what you want me to write. You know, what's, what are you actually asking me for? And that's not the way college works and it's not the way the workplace works. You know, they're not familiar enough with their own, you know, imagination, creativity, being able to think outside the box. You know, th th they really are stuck if there isn't sort of a very specific task given um, to them. Yeah, I was seeing this type of outcome in students who were from all different kinds of backgrounds, ethnically. Sometimes people think it's endemic in only a particular community or two or three. I saw it really across ethnic and racial lines, kids from other countries. Where I didn't see it was in poor and working class kids who by dint of life experience have a toughness, a grit, a resilience, a sort of, I will figure this out for myself. I've skinned my knee on the asphalt of life, so to speak. I'm gonna get back up and I'll be okay. They had that kind of wherewithal that their more affluent peers lacked. I'm pleased to say the book has been, it will be translated so far and published in China, South Korea, Brazil, uh, uh, Canada. Wow. <laughs> Canada. UK, Australia, not translated, but you get the point. And Romania, of all places, who knew? So, yeah, so it sounds like it's resonating in other countries. Yeah. You know, I haven't. Um, I haven't studied it. Um, and as a dean, of course, I um, thought very much about the issue of um, increased rates of sexual assault and rape. Um, I think one of, so what I know is that we're better at encouraging people to come forward and report um, and that accounts in part for the increase in, in our awareness of incidents. Um, if the, I don't think we know whether the actual rates are increasing or whether people are, are more supported in coming forward, less of a stigma, so they do, and they get help. Um, but either way, it's um, a serious, serious problem on college campuses, and, um, and you know, I, I don't know what the connection is to overparenting, um, except maybe that in, in the realm of overparenting, we are often not holding kids accountable um, for their actions, and we're smoothing things over, and we're sort of not wanting that to go on their record, so we sort of absolve, you know, we try to, 
And so we're not, um, we're letting them off the hook for bad behaviors at a younger age, and that might be contributing to it. But I'm a little out of my depth here, so I'm not gonna say more because it's such a serious and important issue. But thank you for raising the question. Hi, my name's Karen Matulis, and Hi, I'm a Karen. new resident here, and I wanna thank you for coming and speaking. I feel honored to be here. Thank you. My question is, um, my kids are your kids' age, 15 and 17, and, and uh, we live in a like wisteria lane, Stepford yeah. Wife place, yeah. and I grew up in Venice, so I was a little out of place. Okay. Um, I am the opposite. I'm a very hands-off parent, yeah. and I felt really bad as they were young, younger because I felt like I was failing them because I wasn't like the lady next door who knew every teacher, every assignment, the background, when it was, you know, I think they were playing the soccer game for their kid, and I yeah. felt like I was a failure, so when I got into my addiction, and all of a sudden I could keep my house as clean as them, my kids could look as good, I knew a little bit more about what was going on at school, but I still wasn't that hands-on. I just figured it was their life and they needed to do it. Well, on the flip side, my ex-husband is not a hoverer, he's a smotherer. Mm. And we still come into conflict about that now. And um, I was wondering if you had any advice or how you see that yeah. in families of divorce. Yeah, it's interesting. I often hear from people saying that this hovering smothering in one, um, which was not the manner of the other parent, is often what led to their split. Um, there's a guy profiled in my book that actually says that. Um, you know, being divorced and raising kids together is complicated enough, and um, trying to get on the same page philosophically is the ideal, but I'm not gonna pretend that's right possible. Here's what I, here's what I will say for, for you. Um, the longest longitudinal study of humans ever conducted, it's called the Harvard Grant Study, and it looked at humans, all men, all Harvard graduates, <laughs> over the course of their lives, from the 30s, late 30s, up until they passed away. Some are, are still alive, very few. And so they just, you know, they know so much about these men who went to Harvard. They weren't all professionally successful. They weren't all happy. It was a lovely way of showing it. It's not just a brand name of the school you go to, you know, or whatever door is open for you. No, uh-uh. The two greatest outcomes from my vantage point of that study were professional success in life comes from having done chores as a child, and the earlier you start, the more professionally successful you are. I know some of you are cringing. <laughs> like, Wait a minute, my kids aren't doing chores. I certainly cringed when I saw that. And then happiness in life comes from love, full stop is the quote. Happiness equals love, full stop. And that means the quality of our interpersonal relationships with our partner, our spouse, you know, our family, our, our friends, the extent to which we have love in life is the greatest predictor of whether we'll say we've, we're happy and professional success comes from chores. So to me, it comes down to love and chores and what school they go to and what they study and the grades they get and what career they have and the salary they have is all sort of window dressing on their lives. That's what I mean by window dressing. You know, so as parents, it's like, are they doing chores? Are they helping out? Why? That develops the pitch-in mindset. Not that I'm entitled, I don't have to do the yucky stuff, but no, you're part of this family or you're part of this workplace or you live in this house with five roommates. You know, you pitch in, you do the work of life. You're useful to others. You can make your own way and clean up after yourself. Be kind to others. You know, that's actually what matters. You know, so. Yeah, at my house they do chores. His house, no. No, <laughs> well. Okay, we have time for five more questions. Five, okay. And then, um, and then we're gonna sign books. Great, excellent. Uh, hi, my name is Beth Slattery, and like my friend Sharon, I am a dean and college counselor at a fancy private school, and uh, <laughs> mother of four, yeah. and, um, and also a former college admission officer, so all okay. this stuff is like just fascinating it. to yep. me. Yeah, yep. um, the comment that I wanted to make is really a, what parents don't understand, I think, about what this does to their relationship with their child. Mm. Because we watch as kids text their, usually moms, the second they get a B plus, um, and the tragedy of the B plus. And, um, and what they don't realize is that as time goes on, those kids are actually growing in resentment to their parents. They actually, parents think they're close to their child because they're in constant contact. Yeah. But those children are starting to feel infantilized. They're feeling incapable and um, and they're angry, and they're coming into our offices and telling us how angry they are with their parents. Yeah. Um, and the parents have no idea. And I honestly saw it in my own life with my oldest child, who's now 16. When he was in fifth grade, um, he started coming home and talking about 
um, worrying about what grades he got. And so he's in fifth grade, and he's um, and I would drop him off at school, and he would come back to the car two and three times. Are you sure I got all my homework done? Are you sure I did everything? Did I definitely do everything? Um, and then he started talking about, I started thinking about what would happen if I stopped our car on train tracks. Okay. And when you have a fifth grader who's saying that, yeah. and I thought I was being just an invested parent when I asked him, what'd you get on that test? Or how'd you do in school today? Right. I also thought that life is linear, that if you, like mine, if you do well in school and you go to a good college, then you get happiness. Well, that actually isn't what created happiness in my life, no. but it was linear. Mm. And so when that happened, because I work at a school yep. and had resources, we got him some help. Yep. And when my ex-husband and I, we realized we got our kid back and we said, never again. Yep. And now I have a 16-year-old that my friend Sharon can attest to is the easiest, loveliest, happiest kid who tells me when he likes a girl, yep. who the last time when he failed a, a Spanish final, I mean, when he got a D in a Spanish final last year, said to me, at least it wasn't an F. Yeah. And I said, you're right, <laughs> yeah. at least it wasn't an F. Yeah. Um, and yeah. when that's the reaction that he knows he's yep. getting from me, yep. it worked. And yep. I just have to say to parents, I understand that the compulsion, yep. but you will get your child back. Beth, thank you for, that was a testimony. Thank you for that. Thank and, you. Um, you know, but here's the thing. So Beth had her kid utter these horrifying words. And I come from Palo Alto, where at my kid's high school, we've just had our second suicide cluster in six years. Gunn High School, G-U-N-N, -N, um, is a high school where teenagers have decided to jump in front of the Caltrain. And, um, you know, we don't, so you were faced with this sort of predecessor to that moment, the thought articulated, and you pivoted. Now, the rest of us have to try to find the guts to pivot instead of pretend, oh, it's not going to be that bad. Pivot sooner so it doesn't even come to that. Like, hear this testimony and say, like, my goodness, you know, yes. And your point about your kid thinks you thought, oh, happiness was, I just took this linear path to happiness. You realize, uh-uh, that's not why you're happy. And many of us have not had a linear path. Many of our paths have gone like this, but our kids don't know it. They just see the job we have and how good we feel and so on, and they think we've been perfect all our lives, which, you know, for the vast majority of us isn't true. And if you ask yourself, like, why am I expecting my kid to be so damn perfect? Because I sure wasn't. You know, why? Why? So thank you for that, Beth. Thank you for sharing. I'm sure many people in this room benefited from that. All right, I know this next person because he's Zachary Warmer, class of 11 at Stanford. Good Hi, to see you, Dean Julie. Nice to see you, Zachary. Just wanted to say either at your either Gunn or Stanford, what would you say the tangible effects upon the institutions, just sort of watching over a multi, kind of multi, several years of this kind of going on? You know, the effect on the institutions is we all need more mental health professionals and bigger facilities <laughs> in which they can work, okay? I mean... You know, at Stanford, it's called Vaden Student Health. Every college campus has some kind of student health center. And, you know, ours was just overwhelmed with the workload. And, you know, they needed more humans to do the work of helping young adults. And, you know, and high schools need that as well. And, of course, we have to destigmatize mental health at, you know, many places, oh, you can't admit you're depressed or you're worried or you're anxious or you're lonely or you're sad. You know, we have to... You know, it's the, it's the positive psychology movement. It's Brene Brown and it's Martin Seligman and it's, you know, all these people who can teach us about we're vulnerable, we're humans, we fail, we suffer. So what? That's where we actually are, are at our most real. We're at our most authentic and connect with other humans if we can actually admit, you know, to these, you know, difficulties, if you will, actually the raw, gooey inside of ourselves. That's actually where we're able to have meaningful connections. So if we can, look, we're in California. We ought to be able to embrace this here can, before the rest of the nation. You know, I mean, the, that's what we need. Can, can I just suggest that maybe, maybe you're, you're, you're naming it wrong? Go ahead. That it's not mental health. It's health. It's, it's health, but it's also a spiritual health. Yes. I, I mean, I'm, okay. I'm pushing this because yeah. mental health is going to, let me give sure. you the pill. Right. I, I right. have the pill that's right. going to make you feel okay. Right. Exactly. It's all in the brain. Right. But this is, you're not no. talking about a brain no, disease No, 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 no. Actually, you're exactly right. So Applaud. I'm suggesting. Applaud Rabbi Mark. Absolutely. No, no, that's yes. right. I'm suggesting yes. that Stanford should set the standard in having spiritual and and mental health, okay, spiritual health, mental health, emotional health, yep. and integrate it. Yes. And we actually yes. have a blueprint for that. Excellent. Okay, so you're going to give that to me. I don't work there anymore. I left three years ago, but they'll be delighted to hear what I think, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> here's no, but I mean, I, they I, I mean, I mean seriously. That, exactly. So it, it is a combination. It is totally a combination. Look, we all humans, whomever we are, whatever our gender, race, ethnicity, religion, or not, you know, our station in life, we all want to be seen, 
We all want to be valued for who we are. We all just want to know we matter. And, you know, that is what has been stripped away from our kids as we focus so much on their grades and scores. They actually think that's their measure of worth as a human. Right. You know, and even if they've achieved it, it makes them feel empty because if they don't continue to achieve it, then they're worthless. So um, I'm encouraged because places like Stanford and Harvard are incorporating into the curriculum things like reflections at Stanford, a new course for freshmen where they sit in small groups with faculty and staff and they talk about what matters to them, their values, who they are, you know, and they can uh, develop, they can know themselves better and apply that knowledge to what they have the chance to learn in university. Harvard is teaching a mindfulness workshop in the residences for this reason to get to become a place where mental health and wellness you know are are t talked about and valued spiritual health not just you know the grades and the scores hi hi thank you for your talk it was great my name's Carrie thank you Carrie um, so you said it earlier chores yeah so I think the big problem we're having with our with our one of our kids is a sense of entitlement. Yeah. We're not so hovering on the grades or anything, yeah. and, and that's I'm okay with that. But chores, I think, are hugely important. Yeah. You, you, you stop slicing and cutting your children's food for them, right? Right. Did you do, what did, what's your approach to getting yeah. these entitled kids yeah. to do some chores? Yeah. So there are a couple sections in the book where I talk about this. I actually have lists of things that kids should be capable of doing for themselves. And if you're like me, you'll be horrified when you see what the experts think a four-year-old is capable of, an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old. You know, Take a look at that because it's very practical stuff around the house to look after their own needs. And then there's the pitch in for the sake of the household. You know, you reach a certain, if you reach a certain degree of affluence, you might be hiring other humans to, you know, do your yard or clean up your house, you know, and then our kids are raised to, th if you plan to sort of ensure that they're always in the leisure class and they won't ever have to clean a toilet, more power to you. But for most of us, particularly young adults, when they get out and they're sharing a place with roommates, they're going to need to know how to sweep and vacuum and clean toilets and do dishes and take the grass, the, the, the garbage out and, you know, and manage their own deadlines, you know, and make their own doctor's appointments and register for school. And so it's all of this kind of, you, you can say to your kids, I don't know how old they are. How old are they? 10 and 14. 10 and 14, yeah. The first thing they're going to say to you is like, what? <laughs> you know, and you're going to say, I should have done this when you guys were, you know, two and six, and I didn't, and now I'm making up for lost time, you know, because one day you're going to be out of the house and need to know you've got these skills. Making food, cleaning it up doing the laundry. My guys now, you know, I mean, and for years now, I've done their own laundry, they do the dishes, they do the garbage, they do the recycling. Um, but I realized this weekend they don't know how to clean toilets. And so I announced to my husband, I said, we need to teach them to clean toilets. And he was, and my family, are, I'm now revealing like this about Dan. You know, he was like, really? Mom, mom's laughing. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I know he was thinking like, yeah, you be the one to tell him. You're going out of town and you want me to tell him to clean the toilets. So I said to our daughter, who's a 14-year-old freshman girl, I was like, hey, honey, um, tomorrow morning, um, I need to teach you to clean the toilets. And <laughs> she looked at me. She was like, what? I have homework, which is always their excuse. <laughs> Why? Because we've taught them that if they say they have homework, we'll do everything for them. They know that. I have a test. OK, fine. You don't have to. No. I was like, ha ha, you're not going to be doing your homework at 10 on Saturday morning, I'm pretty sure. And she was realized I was right. And, and I said, I'm going to show you mine. She was like, I'm not cleaning your toilet. I said, no problem. I'm going to show you how to do it with mine, and then you're going to do your own. She said, OK. Boom. All right? Four-step method for teaching kids any skill. I learned this from the special needs community where you've got to be deliberate, deliberate about teaching skills because the disability might be getting in the way. So the four-step method I've learned is first you do it for them, then, which I've been doing all their lives, then you do it with them. This is like, let me show you. This is how you clean the door. Then you watch them do it, which means you're not doing it, but you're there to say, oh, you forgot this, or try it this way, or what have you. And then step four, they do it completely independently. You know they've got the skill. You don't need to be there. If you think about it, this is how you teach them to cross the street by themselves. It applies to every single other skill they're going to need to have, starting with chores as a great start. OK, so we need you to uh, um, sign books. You are on oh, a, wait a, a minute. time. One more person. OK. Are you a millennial? You look young. 31. Okay. Well, you are, <laughs> technically. Uh, so That's I young. One more. <laughs> yeah. 
So I'm going to be short-winded. I have a uh, split family. Yep. Um, my daughter is five and a half. She started kindergarten. Um, at three, she collapsed singing a song before because she forgot the words. Mm. And that's when I decided I had to split the family because her father was pushing her to read at two. Yeah. She's at third grade and she just started kindergarten. Yeah. And the question I have is, how do you emotionally support the child when either for those who don't have split families, the school's pushing them so hard? Yeah. And then you at home are trying to go yeah. be yourself, you know, right. be happy. And you want to support. And yeah. the, the second part of the question is, if my sister didn't step in when I was in elementary school and say, I know mom and dad don't care about the grades, but I do. And I'll pay you for every A, I'll pay you for B, right? Yeah. And you pay me for Ds and Fs. Okay. And if she didn't do that, I wouldn't have been able to turn around my grades and okay. be successful. So is, how do you find these the balances? middle ground, absolutely. So, you know, I, this, my book, my whole existence in this role is not to say, like, parents shouldn't care about kids, okay? There's a completely different problem of underparenting, you know, often in different communities where parents aren't invested enough in their kids you know, having a good education and, and working hard and trying and putting forth that effort. So I'm glad you had your sister to care about that for you and motivate you. You know, I'm actually talking about the problem at the other end of the spectrum where parents are so hell-bent on certain outcomes that the kid feels, you know, they collapse because they didn't achieve and then you know, the sense of self is constructed on that. Um, you know, I'm not here to, I'm not a mental health professional. So, you know, support your daughter in those ways around, you know, the therapy that she might need. But I would say also have the guts to find a school that's not going to be, you know, measuring her worth by her GPA and kind of test prepping her up the wazoo and that kind of thing. In other words, find the community, find the, the people, the educators, the friends and so on who believe in educating the whole human and in valuing kids for who they are and helping them become their best selves rather than making them into something we wish they would be and surround yourself with those people. The, the last two chapters of the book are about how to be the parent you want to be and build community with others like you because it's lonely to do it alone and you can feel weird, you can feel like the outlier when everyone else is over parenting. You know, we have to, it's not neglect to let our kids walk to the park, it's building independence. You know, it's not neglect to make them do their own homework. You know, it's teaching them how to do the work for themselves. So we have to embrace that language, which is we're not backing up. We're not lazy parents. We're not neglectful parents. We actually know our job is to put ourselves out of a job and raise a kid to independent, self-actualized adulthood. And the only way they get here is by doing it for themselves.